What's going on YouTube? Welcome back to my Function to Speed channel. Today I'm going to be dabbling in the Jeep a bit. Um, it's been a long time since I've showed her any love. Um, this is going to be my rear axle swap. This is a Ford 88 swap out of a Ford Explorer. Um, a semi-common swap these days. Even though all the magazines and websites seem to recommend going elsewhere than this axle. Um, they're always talking about getting Dana 44s out of different vehicles, which are generally much wider track, which isn't always good for a daily driver. I mean, it's good for if you're doing trail shit. Um, but as for like a direct swap, uh, this axle is about as close a width as you want. I mean, I think it's uh, within 3 eighths or 5 eighths narrower than like a factory uh, TJ axle, like that 35 under my axle, or under my Jeep. Um, anybody that's been playing with Jeeps, especially TJ, YJ, they know that 35s, Dana 35s are a joke. They hold up fine for daily driving, but as soon as you throw bigger tires, you better not put a locker in it. Um, otherwise you're gonna grenade the thing. Um, they got flimsy axle tubes, flimsy little axle shafts. Um, yeah, really not worth putting much money into. I know a lot of people, they'll throw 1500 bucks at it and make something solid. Um, but this axle here out of the Explorer, they're all 31 spline axles um, versus the, I think it's 27 in the 35, um, versus 30 in a 44, in a Dana 44. So these are, they're a little bigger than a Dana 44, um, except they're like 25% uh, stronger than the 44 axles. Just that one extra spline, which translates to a larger diameter shaft, is about a 25% increase on a Dana 44. Um, go check out the Dana Spicer numbers. Um, I think it's uh, the Dana 44 is rated at uh, 4,500 foot-pound of torque, like instantaneous torque loads, like uh, you know if you dump the clutch, kind of thing. Um, it's not saying put a 4,000 foot-pound of torque motor on it. Uh, you're missing the physics involved. Um, while the these axles here in uh, 31 splines are rated for over 6,000 uh, foot-pound of torque, uh, like right there at just over 6,000. So, I mean, that's a massive increase. Also, you may get lucky enough and get a, a limited slip, like the Ford Track Lock. Um, this did have a Ford Track Lock in it, except I sold it to a buddy, because um, I actually went with, let's see, I've got parts and masks for this project everywhere. Behind a bug spray, you got a Yukon Grizzly Lock. Um, basically a uh, Detroit locker. It's an auto locker. No uh, pneumatics, no cables, no electronics involved. It's get on the gas, it locks. You get off the gas, it unlocks. Uh, so you gotta learn to drive it. Um, and I also have the Yukon axle shafts. Um, there's a chrome molly shafts, C-clip eliminator. Um, it actually ends up making the axle a little bit wider than uh, thin the factory track or factory TJ axle. Um, it takes it out. It's like seven eighths of an inch wider uh, track width. Then, so that's because the uh, C clip eliminators. What they end up doing is instead of having an an axle bearing pushed into the axle, keep in mind this semi float axles. Um, the train of thought. Hello. Oh, um, and you end up sliding your axle shaft in and then installing a C-clip in here in the carrier in order to keep it in place. The C-clip eliminator ends up pressing on the bearing onto the axle shaft and then bolting this big retainer uh, to these four bolts that are usually for the uh, rear brake drum, like the parking brake drum and caliper bracket. So that means that you don't have to pop that cover you don't have to lose all that fluid when you want to like pull the shaft out um, that means you pull these four bolts whoop, the whole axle whole wheel brake everything and come right off if you're in your hand if you want um, really the only benefit of that is uh, though you're not relying on the c-clip to keep your axle shaft in um, there's a lot of issues where uh, not that a C-clip is really all that weak, um, but if you were to break your axle shaft, um, you know, crawling over a rock or whatever, capture the wheel and pop, grenade the axle shaft. Um, 
having it retained down here keeps the whole axle and wheel and everything from sliding out. Um, if, since it's retained back there in like a standard C-clip axle, popping it here means the whole thing, your whole wheel walks away, gone. Um, go look up some images, look up broken axle shaft, Dana 35 or whatever. You're gonna find a lot of images where you've got what looks like a spindly little axle shaft connected to the brakes and the wheel. You see the wheel just walking away from the vehicle. Um, so, C-clip eliminators, pretty cool. Basically gets you as close to a full float axle as you can, but um, like in a full float, you're able to basically pull the axle shaft out like the wheel and the weight of the vehicle is not riding on um, the axle shaft at all. Um, you can unbolt the axle shaft, slide the axle shaft out, and the whole wheel and brake assembly is still retained to the axle itself. Um, kind of like in uh, a front wheel drive car, even your our front axles, how um, the bearing retainer is not attached with the axle at all. Uh, it's, the axles are basically just spline to spline. Um, anyhow, sorry for sidetracking. Um, this is going to be using the Artec Truss uh, for the TJ 8.8 swap. Um, read a lot about this, seen a lot. People love these trusses. I was initially planning on building my own truss and doing a long arm swap, stretch a little bit, you know, do all kinds of fancy shit all at once. Um, but it turned out that was holding me back. I, it's a big, big project, big bite, and my daily driver Plus, it's like I'm ADD with all my projects. It was keeping me from getting this done. So I said, fuck it, I'm going to get the truss. Cost me, I think, 320 something bucks. Um, go ahead and burn that in. It'll be a great, fun project. Plus, I haven't seen anybody else do any how to videos for this truss specifically. I've seen a lot of, hey, look what I did videos, but I'm going to try and document the whole build. Maybe, uh, maybe hit a sticky on uh, some of the sites. We don't know. Um, yeah, I'm gonna try and get you some good images. What I've got so far, like I said, this is an 8.8 that I got. Um, cut all the brackets off already, cleaned up the axle tubes. Um, what you see in there now, um, I've got some aluminum uh, bushings, more or less, that I, that I made, well, had made for me, out of a slug of aluminum to allow me to pass this inch and a half bar through it so I could tell if uh, the axle shaft or the axle tubes were bent. Um, as you see here, Mandrel comes right out, slides right back in, uh, and these are dead ass fits. I mean, we're talking like this aluminum is five or six thousandths larger than this uh, bar, and vice versa, they're about six or eight thousandths smaller than the axle tube. So the fact that it slides in that easily shows you that this thing's pretty damn straight. They weren't straight before, they were out, both tubes were out over a half of an inch. Um, in different directions uh, when I had this. Like I had series like three eighths to a half an inch of uh, deflection. I mean, it looked like this. I'll show you on this side since my bar is too short. Like it was as if this bitch was sitting about right there. I mean, it was seriously bent. So I ended up heating, um, heating both of these tubes, basically the back side of where I uh, needed to, needed them to move. It's like. If it was sitting here, that means I would be heating it on the um, the far side, the currently the far side where it's um, of the axle tube here. So like if, boom, if it's, that's how the slug was sitting, I'd end up heating it on the top side to let it basically pull it back into the direction I require. So when I heated it, it's as if it made this worse. Heat it with like red hot with a torch, like we're talking an eight or 10 inch strip. Um, and then as it cooled, it slowly bent it back down into position. So, until now, it's pretty damn straight. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's very close. Um, axles, they bend under uh, standard duty out in the street. Well, maybe not standard duty, but thump a curb hard enough, you're going to bend an axle tube. That's uh, the beauty of this axle is that it's got three and a quarter inch tubes, where the TJ it was like two and three quarter inch, I think. Dana 44s are even smaller tubes than this. Um, so, I mean, this has got generally very strong tubes also. Another major uh, selling point for this axle. It's one of the issues with the, uh, the TJ 
the the Rubicons that came with Dana 44s, they basically all they got were Dana 44 center housings and carriers, so they could run a Dana 44 ring gear, pinion, and axle shafts. But everything from the outside was still the tiny little TJ parts, like Dana 35, Dana 30 parts, steering systems, axle tubes, the works. So really, you weren't getting a full size axle. You weren't getting a solid heavy duty axle. You're getting flimsy shit out here. So all you gain is uh, the bending resistance of the axle shaft itself. That's the only way that you're increasing the strength of this section over here is by every time this tries to bend, it's fighting a larger axle shaft now, which, yeah, yeah, it's got its benefits. I mean, you're not gonna be breaking an axle shaft so much, but once you bend this shit out of whack too far, you end up loading uh, spider gears and breaking spider gears. Auto lockers don't work how they're supposed to. I mean, it's hairy. Um, so that's the goal. We're going full size, basically three quarter ton axles um, in my Jeep. So, all right, guys, we're going to stop you there and uh, I'll get some unpacking uh, clips. Oh, that's what I meant to say about these. Uh, Aluminum bushings. I ended up getting hosed on that. I probably had a hundred dollar slug of aluminum, maybe eighty dollar slug of aluminum. Um, I think three and a half inch I got. Took it to a guy, gave him specs. He said, "Yeah, I can do that." And it was like five or six hundred dollars later. He gave these back. And I was like, "You got to be kidding me!" I wasn't expecting a hit like that. I was hoping maybe a hundred fifty bucks. So that's why I went out and I bought my own lathe now to. So when I got to do stuff like that got it under control yep it's uh same thing's gonna happen when i need a mill i'm gonna buy my own and learn how to use it um so i can screw up a couple of hundred dollar chunks myself before i get it right and probably won't save me any money but i'll have some good youtube videos so all right folks um cool let me get my uh ducks in a row and i'll uh get you back on